Whether you have a skin interest, a skin query, a skin trauma, or skin disease, I warmly welcome you to Heal Thy Skin, a podcast brought to you by Derm Health Co. I'm Marnie, dermal clinician, dermoscopist, and your podcast host. Skin is deeper than beauty, and our mission is to build the largest platform of specialized practitioners focused on skin health and skin empowerment. Join me each week where we go deep into the skin and beyond to hear stories and education from leading practitioners on a journey of skin health. Hello, welcome to the Heal Thy Skin podcast. I'm Mani, your host, and today I am speaking with Dr. Adam Sheridan of the Australasian College of Dermatologists and Cancer Council Australia. In commemoration of Skin Cancer Action Week, we're going to be covering all things UV and when UV damage is perhaps too late to repair. We're going to be talking about the Own Your Tone campaign, and we're also going to have a chat about Sid the Seagull, a campaign which was launched in the 1980s for the Slip Slop Slut message and how that's changed over the years. I started by asking Dr. Sheridan what he thought was the biggest misconception about tanning. I personally think the biggest misconception is that a tan is healthy or somehow a sign of vitality, health, perhaps even wealth, desirability, all of that. You know, I think to myself in the media, gleaming teeth, the tan, the yacht, that sort of thing. And most of your listeners have heard the term healthy tan, maybe as a compliment after a sunny holiday away. Whereas uh, killjoy, as it sounds from the dermatologist, we probably should be conveying condolences in a way on how badly someone has damaged and, you know, prematurely aged their skin. That would probably be number one, that a tan somehow goes to health. A related misconception is perhaps that a tan, once it's there, once you've built it up, is somehow protective against future further sun damage you know, and reduces your risk of weathering and ageing and nothing could be further from the truth. But worst of all, the biggest myth that we still encounter from time to time is that a fake tan somehow is protective. So a natural tan, a fake tan from the sun or the bottle, none of them are protective and if anything, they indicate well-established damage of your skin and a heightened skin cancer risk. Yes, lots of myths there. We are going to break down some of those today as well. But first of all, tell us mm. about your career and how you got to do the work that you're doing today. Well, I grew up in sunny Adelaide. I went to medical school at the University of Adelaide, which was fantastic. I encourage anyone to go to that medical school. When I graduated, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to Oxford to start my specialist training in dermatology. Oxford was also fantastic, so I stayed on a bit longer and did a clinical research fellowship in plastic surgery, then came back to Australia, finished off the specialist training, and then what next? A year as a consultant back in the UK at Oxford, and then a year or two in private practice in Australia. And then at that point, I really discovered what I really wanted to do and undertook some advanced training in a technique called Mohs Micrographic Surgery, that skin cancer surgery Trimmer Medalli did that in Perth and now I'm back consulting and operating in Melbourne and Adelaide and my specialty is Mohs surgery so skin cancer surgery through that with the College of Australasian the Australasian College of Dermatologists we link up with the Cancer Council to deliver training to GPs and uh, health professionals in early diagnosis and treatment of skin cancer which I guess brings me to you in this great podcast and the awareness week. Yes, fantastic. We really couldn't have anyone more experienced in skin cancer. Let's talk about the prevention and early detection of skin cancer. You mentioned earlier about the TANS. How paramount is this prevention and what are the comparative success rates when we have early detection? Oh gosh, look, without a doubt, early detection is the absolute key to a good outcome with skin cancer. If you detect it early, you've maximised your chance of a great cure rate, keeps the treatment and therefore the recovery time pretty straightforward and low key. In some cases, if you catch a skin cancer early enough, something as simple as a, a quick freeze by a GP, a curette, that's where they scrape the tumour away, or even a cream or laser will suffice. On the other hand, if you allow the skin cancer to develop, things get more serious quite quickly and soon you you know you find yourself in a conversation about surgery, radiotherapy, the aggressive treatments and with those goes the drawn out recovery, prolonged follow up and all that that entails. The one I would think about that's a clear example would be melanoma. 
if you detect that before the melanoma has achieved a depth uh, into your skin of, say, 0.75 millimetres, the cure rate is excellent. But if uh, the diagnosis is delayed and the melanoma goes deeper than a millimetre, the 10-year survival rate of the individual falls quite significantly and oftentimes multidisciplinary care is required. So although the, the good news is that melanoma treatment is improving year on year, the deeper the melanoma at the time of diagnosis, the more complicated the treatment, and to put it bluntly, the, the lower the, the long-term cure rate. All the so, yeah, more, early detection. Yeah, all the more reason to ensure that people are having at least annual skin checks, if not more regularly, if they're higher risk. Let's talk sun protection because skincare companies, social media has significantly increased awareness about sunscreen over the last few summers, especially, and it's almost become this cult must have product, which is fantastic. But sunscreen is only part of the solution to preventing skin cancer. Can you explain why this is? Yeah, well, I guess to put it into a bit of context, I like to remember that every second the sun is said to produce as much energy as, what is it, one trillion megaton bombs. So someone told me that in one second, the sun's producing enough energy to power modern civilization as we're enjoying it now for about 500,000 years. So that's a lot of energy. Wow. So to think that all, yes, it's pretty full on. So if you think of all that across the solar system, through our atmosphere, past a few birds and clouds, maybe through your car window, you know, to think it's suddenly going to give up when it hits a lick of sunscreen is uh, optimistic at best. So, uh, you know, you really do need a combination approach. The sunscreen is invaluable, but, you know, the slip, slop, slap, uh, the sunscreen, the shade, sunglasses, hat, it's all relevant. Yeah, it's quite interesting, isn't it? What an emphasis we put on sunscreen. But when you tell us something that's so visual, I'm literally just thinking of skin frying. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. Now, in regards to, I guess, also social elements of sun, teenagers are still getting burnt on summer weekends. I think it's one in four, 26%. And a survey showed that there has been no significant decrease in teenage sunburn rates in the last 12 years. Why do you think this message isn't getting through despite so much more awareness and education in the media? That's a tricky one. I would never put myself out as an adolescent psychologist, but... Maybe it's not so much that the message isn't getting through, it's just more an issue with execution. I'm pretty sure that, you know, close to 100% of teenagers out there would answer a true or false MCQ on sunscreen correctly. They, they know it's good for you, but it's probably more putting that knowledge of benefits into practice in their sort of complicated real world. I was thinking about this the other day. I, I reckon one aspect might be that it goes to what we were chatting about earlier, that there's this misconception of the tan being a sign of you know, health or even desirability. So to a teenager, maybe you know, sunburn can potentially result in immediate you know, gain in kudos or you know, peer acceptance, attractiveness, all of that, whereas the downside, premature ageing, skin cancer, that's not necessarily front of mind in a, in a teenager living in the now. But again, I'm no psychologist. That's just my take from friends and family. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully. And I think there's also that sense of being completely invincible and that a common misconception that we've heard from other experts on the podcast say that a misconception about skin cancer is that people think it's an el- like a disease of the elderly, which we know is just simply not the case as younger and younger people are developing skin cancer. Yes, this is absolutely true. The youngest, I mean, in our practice we had was an eight-year-old, admittedly exposed to full-on sun from, you know, basically from birth in the Fremantle sun. But yes, age is not something that protects you. Yeah, it's um, that whole thing of a healthy tan again. And obviously the message hasn't gone through to the parents. What are the best things that parents can do to teach their kids and teenagers about the importance of sun safety? To that, I would say that nothing beats leading by example. You know, we all know our habits, good and bad, tend to be handed down through the generations. And children are definitely, from my limited experience, quick to pick up on any gaps between your parental advice and your actual, you know, action as the actions as the parents. So I feel it's very powerful to demonstrate how important sun protection is in your own daily life. Be seen to putting on the hat, sunscreen, and perhaps even be 
sort of open and honest regarding any mistakes you yourself have made in the past, you know, bad sunburns you've sustained. It's actually very striking to me how memorable it is to children, even adult children, when their parents have undergone skin cancer surgery. You know, they've come home with stitches, big dressing, all of that. And that kind of exposure early in life can really power positive action. So if anything, I'd be, you know, open about sunburns you've had or regrets you've had or, you know, the pigmented patch on your cheek or the, <laughs> the wrinkles you could have saved yourself. Yeah, for the that's benefit right. of the next generation. Yeah, that's really good advice. In relation to just some more sun safety type measures, I'd like to just ask some more questions, not necessarily about um, sunscreen. There's lots of information about sunscreen, but some other safety measures that we might use, such as sunglasses, such as clothing, and some of those key uh, components to ensure that something is in fact going to protect you from the sun because we know things such as fashion sunglasses aren't going to offer much protection. Is there some things that you provide information to your clients about what to look for in clothing and or sunglasses? Well, generally if um, with clothing, you know, be it hats, shirts, sunglasses, they generally should include an SPF or a clothing, sometimes it's called a clothing protection factor and SPF factor rating. So, you know, if you're at your optometrist ordering sunglasses, the, the, the rating should be there clearly visible for you to see that it has um, UV blocking activity. Clothing can be a bit uh, trickier unless you source a, a specialty store. But, but again, there are things out there, rashy vest uh, sports wear hats and the like that will tell you the clothing protection factor. A really simple thing just in day-to-day practice, if you hold a t-shirt up you know, to the light in the, the store and you can see through it, obviously, you know, that's just a, an indoor room light and sun is going to get through. So that's a simple measure just in the store, how, how flimsy or see-through is it, but you should look for the rating that's often there with the product. Yep. Okay. Fabulous. Dr. Sheridan, talk to us about the hashtag Own Your Tone. Oh yeah. Well, this was a really good campaign in 2019 and that was very much focused on encouraging people to understand, you know, in a way embrace their, their own natural skin tone and then to use the, the five forms of sun protection to protect and maintain that. So, you know, the five things are slip, uh, slop, slap, seek and slide. So the slip is the clothing, slopping on the sunscreen, uh, slapping on the hat, seeking out shade and sliding on the SPF rated sunglasses. Yeah, because very much if you employ those simple measures and if you get to know your own skin type and check for changes in that, that they are really powerful steps in reducing your actual skin cancer risk. Other factors apart, well, the the single greatest factor causing skin cancer, I'm sure everyone out there knows, is excessive UV exposure. But then the flip side of that is your skin type and how sensitive you are to that exposure. So, you know, fair skin, fair hair, increased number of moles. If you immunosuppressed or taking immunomodulatory medication, you've got a family history of skin cancer, especially if that was melanoma. They're all things that sort of push you up the curve. So knowing your skin type and where you are on the spectrum of risk, that's very valuable. And that Own Your Own, Own Your Tone campaign was all around that. Yeah, interesting. I've also seen some not associated with the National Skin Cancer Action Week, but images of people where they've held their arm, their forearm up to their stomach, where their stomach has never really been exposed to the sun and then their forearm has. And just the vast difference of skin tone, skin texture and skin quality after years and years of sun exposure, even if it is incidental on the forearms. And it just brings even a new meaning to that hashtag, own your tone. Because, yeah, sometimes we might actually forget <laughs> how fair we yeah. are because we think, oh, well, we're quite tanned on our shoulders or our forearms. Yeah. we. I don't know if it's suitable for a podcast, but sometimes we half joking at the clinic talk about if you compare, you know, the eight-year-old golfer's face with the eight-year-old golfer's bottom, <laughs> the, the skin <laughs> quality is uh, totally different. And then, you know, the punchline is, and they've been sitting on their bottom for 80 years and it still looks better than the face so that right there you can see how much weathering does have an effect 
Yes, um, yes very please, good edit point. that out if inappropriate. <laughs> no, I think we're allowed to say bottom on the podcast. It's completely fine. <laughs> yeah. So for those of us that maybe still aren't convinced and still loving our tan, hoping that's none of the listeners out there, but for those that still need a little bit of convincing, sun's exposure doesn't just increase our risk of skin cancer. It also exhilarates aging and pigmentation concerns has a great memory and really i just like to from a perspective of a dermatologist how late is too late in regards to preventing this damage and reducing this exhilarated aging effects of the sun yeah that is a really good one we will sometimes get patients coming you know very damaged skin maybe they've had a skin cancer removed and they sort of slump down in the chair and say yeah it's too late the damage is done and I really would, yeah, really get the positive message out there that it is never too late to turn things around. Obviously, the earlier you start, the better, but it is never too late. I'd almost liken it to, what can I think of, arthritis? Oh, I don't know, your personal finances or something like that. You know, your body, your life can absorb and bounce back from a lot of careless handling early in life. But there, obviously, there does come a point where you overwhelm your recuperative capacity and it starts to show but the skin is incredible. We like to remind our patients that the skin does turn over once a month. So really, you're only ever one month away from slightly improved skin. So, you know, if you put in the hard work now, it will improve. You know, look after your skin now and it'll look after you for no doubt decades to come. Yeah. I wouldn't give up. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great advice. And even just 30 days, like just commit to 30 days and you will be preventing sun damage and exhilarated aging if you start today. What would you like to see in the future of skin cancer prevention and treatments? Well, personally, I'd really hope to see education about skin health, skin cancer prevention established as really a bedrock of early childhood education, almost like a foundational life skill. I think it'd be great if this stuff was taught from, you know, your preschool years onwards up there with, I don't know, swimming, other survival skills, you know, literacy and numeracy. That would be something I'd really hope for. Mm. Obviously, survival rates improving with the increased awareness and we're grateful um, to you, podcasts and other people out there spreading the word and treatments are improving all the time. There's a lot of exciting stuff around immunotherapy and alternatives to surgery. And what else? Another big area would be artificial intelligence, AI-assisted diagnosis and uh, management. That's quite exciting and promising. But saying all of that, nothing beats early diagnosis. Part of that's early recognition and you know, early establishment of the habits of skin protection, being aware of your skin, looking for changes. And I think that all starts with childhood education. It would be great if that was implanted really in preschool. Yeah, so many amazing things that are slowly happening, but I agree it would be great to see more of. Just a question about parents looking at their children's skin. We know that anything mm. new, evolving, changing is really important to have looked at by a skin cancer GP or dermatologist. But we also know that children's skin is changing all the time and they will continue to develop moles and different lesions through their developmental stages. When should a parent go seek a second or go seek investigation or go see their GP about their child's skin? Like everything, yeah, it really is a balance between caution and paranoia. You are quite right. The child's skin evolves continuously through to, you know, beyond the teen years. There is a misconception that birthmarks are present right there on the day of birth. So new moles, new changes, it's quite natural for them to appear uh, through early childhood, even into early teenage years and sometimes beyond. But basically, if you see a lesion that looks out of place on the child or out of place in the context of your family skin, you know, brothers, sisters, mum, dad don't have a lesion that's behaving that way. If the lesion had an unusual symptom, so the child herself is focused on the lesion or seems troubled by it, I think it's entirely valid at an early stage. At the very least, you leave with a baseline knowledge that your child has normal, healthy skin, and then you, you work from there. I guess I would encourage any concern to be brought to the attention of your general practitioner, and if they have any concerns, they'll refer you to a, a dermatologist, paediatric physician, or someone otherwise skilled. Having said all of that, skin cancer, be it non-melanoma or melanoma, generally is a condition for after puberty. So it's rare and unlikely before puberty that is something 
scary like a skin cancer but if you have a concern please bring it to a doctor every doctor will have a story of a very young child having something of note so never ignore it that's great advice and practical for parents as well so thank you Dr. Sheridan, I'd like to ask about National Skin Cancer Action Week. Yeah, tell us about the festivities and I guess how you're a part of it and also the general importance behind it. Yeah, I hope it's uh, festive and enjoyable for people, but it really is just uh, an opportunity to build awareness, get awareness out there, trigger some conversations. Again, we really appreciate informative podcasts like this one just to get people in the community aware and thinking and talking about skin cancer. The theme this year is still the same sun. I think the aim behind that was to remind all the adults of today, the parents of today, about the classic slip, slop, slap campaign back in the 80s and to remind them that um, although, you know, the world, their lives may have changed, the sun is pretty much the same up there and just as dangerous. So, you know, we still have to regard it and enjoy it and experience it with care. Yeah, so we really hope People get involved through this podcast, through information from the professional colleges, the Cancer Council. There's a whole lot of information on their websites or available in print that you know you can digest and learn from and share yourself uh, physically and social media. Yeah, fantastic. And for those 80s and 90s babies, perhaps have a look <laughs> at the Sid the Seagull original campaign of the Slip Slop Slap. It will be... Yeah, what a classic. Yeah, what a classic, right? Yeah, I love looking back at things, old ads like that. And the message, yes, has, I guess, advanced in some ways. They've added a few extra words, but in other ways, you are absolutely correct. It is still the same sun and what a wonderful topic for this year's campaign. Can you share a few pieces of advice that we haven't already covered today just for listeners, especially in Australia, because summer is approaching? Three pieces, well, yeah, three pieces of practical advice. If number one, basically get your and your loved one's uh, skin checked now. It, now's a good time before summer because then you get to establish a hopefully healthy baseline. You know what you have now is healthy and normal and you observe for changes over summer when you're out in the sun and your skin's more you know, visible, you're out there. Number two, please actively engage in daily skin cancer prevention measures. I'd encourage people to see it as something as basic and routine as, you know, perhaps brushing your teeth or putting on your seatbelt when you get in the car. I like to think, you know, when you get in the car, you don't try and second guess your your statistical risk that particular day of having a car accident. You just whack the sunbelt on. Oh, sorry, <laughs> seatbelt, not sunbelt, on. And really in Australia, there's no point trying to second guess the weather. There's lots of apps, the UV apps, the weatherman, but none of them are 100% reliable. And that, that Aussie sun is up there blazing away every day, be it blue sky or grey. So I, I guess a real a strong message would be just minimise your risk across the board in a routine, automatic way every day. SPF 50 plus, wear a hat and sunglasses and appropriate clothing. And without you know pushing the analogy too far, if you know you're going to be out there seeking the sun or enjoying outdoors activity for a prolonged period, maybe like the, uh, the rally driver who screws on his helmet and you know, buckles in further, maybe that day you reach for the extra thick, um, you know, classic 80s zinc sunscreen and reapply it throughout the day. So that'd be point two is just to get into the habit um, without thinking about it or assessing day to day. What was it? Number three, really just to keep a close watch for any changes. Um, In the past, dermatologists and other doctors, we used to emphasize the darkness of lesions. I'm sure a lot of your listeners will remember all the campaigns about if you've got a changing black spot, um, you know, get to the doctor. In that, in reality, change, that's the thing that's key. So if you were to notice any unremitting change in a skin lesion, that's relevant and should be assessed closely, ideally by your doctor. Personally, I find a four-week rule is helpful. So if you have a lesion that's changing, generating symptoms or, or the like for more than four weeks, or if you just don't like the look of it, get it assessed by your GP. You know, they might involve a dermatologist. Don't ignore it. Another, I guess, cardinal sign within that is spontaneous bleeding. If you've got a lesion uh, that's bleeding without any definite trauma, uh, that, that is a very uh, key sign. That's unusual and should be checked. Mm, yeah, so important. I would just like to ask a little bit further on changes in our skin because 
life is busy. We're not necessarily going to remember exactly what a lesion is going to look like. And we get lots of questions from people about skin checks, mole maps, the different types. How do you recommend, number one, how people can actually monitor their lesions from home is just taking a photo with their smartphone ample? And number two, when would someone need, say, a mole map compared to maybe a, just a skin check? Yeah, gosh, that, that is an excellent question that comes up a lot. I think, so number one, that kind of goes to point one of the advice I think when you're starting your, how do you say, skin care or skin monitoring journey, it's good to see a doctor who knows what they're doing to establish your baseline. So you want to go along to your GP. Most Australian GPs are extremely well trained in all of this to check that at baseline, your skin looks stable. There's nothing untoward that needs action now. Maybe following that appointment, you, the doctor, or maybe both of you would photo document your skin And you're quite right. Modern technology is amazing. The average smartphone that we're carrying in our pocket has an incredible camera. So ideally, you want to take a photo, you know, probably in your underwear, front and back and side on in a kind of a, how do you say, an Egyptian walking pose. So you've covered the front, back and uh, side of uh, limbs and torso and store that somewhere secure and private. And that's now your baseline. And, you know, current technology being what it is, if you notice a symptom or suspected change, you can revert to that. So for nine out of 10 patients or people in Australia, that will suffice. You probably layer on top of that in the absence of any specific further risk factor specific to yourself, you make an annual appointment with your general practitioner, you know, the doctor at their practice who's got an interest in skin for just a scheduled check. I always feel sorry for GPs where they've got a lot to contend with and then, you know, at the end of your blood pressure consult or getting your scripts or can you check my skin doc it'd be nice for them if you scheduled a special standalone check annually the baseline photo the storage you being wise to any changes and then just a scheduled check annually to start with that covers most people the role of more professional photographs the various algorithms or comparison of photographs over time through the hospital or or, or various providers, that's more for someone who has so many moles, it's confusing and hard to track, or in someone who has a high familial risk of melanoma or personal risk of melanoma or indeed has had a melanoma themselves. Then Then usually your doctor will actually assist in identifying that need for you and arranging for it. So I'm not sure if that's helpful, but I... It's very helpful. Just um, clear doesn't need to be overcomplicated, but definitely start with the, your smartphone because, as you said, they take wonderful photographs. Now, Dr. Sheridan, where can people find more about you and the work that you do? Uh, well, for me personally, they could uh, visit our clinic website, sdsl.com.au, and just more generally, they could visit the Australasian College of Dermatologists website. I think there's a find a dermatologist function on there. I'm there. Uh, your local dermatologists are all there. And without being too biased, you know, dermatologists are the best place to uh, help you with any skin issue. And if you go on the website, you'll find someone locally who's highly qualified and waiting to look after you. So, Dr. Sheridan, where can people find more about National Skin Cancer Action Week? Well, yeah, thanks to you and others in the media and the peak professional bodies like the Australasian College of Dermatologists and Cancer Council, there's a fair bit of information out there online and in print. So, you know, if if someone was to visit their favourite search engine, visit the College of Dermatologists website or the Cancer Council website, there'd be a lot of valuable information there, things to share via social media, to print off, share at the workplace, and hopefully get people talking and spreading the word about skin cancer prevention. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing the message with us today and being a guest on today's show. Thanks for having me, Marnina. It's been a real pleasure. What a great convo. I hope you have learned some extra things about sun tanning, UV and skin cancer in Australia. Get involved with the Skin Cancer Action Week from the Cancer Council Australia. Dr. Sheridan gave lots of uh, great resources for you to have a look at. All the links are also in the show notes. And just as a reminder for this week or this year's Skin Cancer Action Week is still the same sun 
and it most certainly is. It's still burning brighter and hotter as it ever was and over time this can cause significant damage to our skin cells which may lead to skin cancer. So share this with maybe a fellow skin lover that might need a little bit of a reminder to look after their skin. Thank you for joining us and until next week, be skin powered.